The Manifestation of the Sons of God, Chapter 24, The Creative Word of the Kingdom. Our concern for some time has been the release of the creative word of, the, of power. For God is bringing forth a level of authority and anointing that is beginning to break down the barriers existing literally between the veils. It is a word that destroys, at Paul, as Paul calls it, fortresses, Second Corinthians 10. This concerns what must happen before we move with the authority over the rulers of this present age. The word is coming that has begun to remove the limitations within our thinking of who we are, what we are, and what we've been given. Second Corinthians 10, the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculation and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. That's a powerful scripture. Because so much of the warfare the saints go through is in the mind and the mental realm where Satan comes and says, Hath God said, Who are you? And we haven't even realized the severity of the internal conflict that we face because the soul wards against the spirit. In what way? By, by thoughts and emotions and concepts and paradigms. And yet Second Corinthians says, we take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. There is that demand that says, I'm not going to allow this, the mind of the soul, which is not who you are, to just run down the road. I will take dominion over it and demand it come into the obedience of Christ. It's a magical word. The magical word here, obedience. Obedience. We should probably just walk around the room and chant that about 20 times. Obedience, obedience, obedience. What's the flip side of obedience? Rebellion. Obedience, rebellion. Very powerful in this time where we're seeing the culmination of God's dealing with man and we're seeing the completion of the crucifixion of the soul. There's that which is the rebellious nature of the soul that says, I will have it my way. Or the drive of the spirit within you that says, I will lay everything before him and I will walk as an obedient son. That is the battle. And that is the chapter in each and every son's life that has not been fully written yet. You might say, well, we're all destined. It's all been preordained. It has. To a point. To a point. Where at this time, you finish writing the last chapter of your own life. Will you walk obediently? Or will you allow the soul to determine your truth? As the walls and illusions that we have held on to continue to fall, we will see a rising tide of awareness within God's people. This is the prelude to the release of a living word of judgment for this hour, a word that will flow through his sons. The gospels speak of the Spirit that must reside within God's people if the changes that are slated to happen within them are to begin. What is this quality of spirit? A drive or intensity that will not settle for anything short of the full release of the kingdom. As Christ spoke, it is the violent who take the kingdom by force. For it is the kingdom within you that you are driven for not an external kingdom, not yet, not at this point. Matthew 11, 
and from the days of John the Baptist until now the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and violent men take it by force. Is the kingdom brought forth by men of passivity or indifference, the very essence of this age? Not at all. Is it brought forth by the politically correct? No. There must be an intensity, a violence, a drive, and a demand born of the Spirit within you. And perhaps you've only touched upon this level of intensity from time to time. But this will become your lifestyle. This has the address of the sons of God written all over it. We must make this shift if we are to accomplish what we have been sent here to do. It will take an abandonment of all that we are. Wow. We're talking total here. And we're not talking partial. God isn't going to put up with the duplicity. It will take an absolute, complete, and total abandonment of all that we are if we are to make and accomplish what we've been sent here to do. That's scary, because a lot, many, will not make this transition. Can we sustain this type of drive? No, not after the soul of the flesh, only by the Spirit, the Spirit within. It's only by His grace that we're able to sustain such a drive, and that comes from the vision that He has written deeply upon our heart. This violence of spirit is at the crux of what it will now take to make the transition to this level of the kingdom. For the last several years, the cloud of witnesses have been waiting, urging us on, urging us to lay hold of that for which we have been laid hold of in Christ Jesus. A number of times they have come, frustrated, concerned, perplexed, because they have not understood why we have not been able to see how great an endowment that we have resting upon us. We have functioned too much as paupers, not yet recognizing the mantle and the endowment which has been given. We've been slow to recognize the scepter of authority which has been placed in our hands. We've seen only a trickle of the power or authority of Christ, which has already been given to his sons, yet he has committed everything into our hands. And why is this? because his sons are still in the process of having their eyes open to see. The maturing process has perhaps taken a bit longer, but you're coming to the time of graduation. We've been in a time of accelerated change and growth, as I've mentioned before, and the eyes of his people are starting to open. You may still see men as trees walking, But God is opening the eyes of his seers and sons, and he is removing the shackles around their ankles and the scales off of their eyes. And as these scales fall off, they will experience a level of authority and control that they have not seen or experienced heretofore. God's sons are beginning to move into a level of control that will determine the future events that are to unfold during this time. This is being accomplished through the ability God has established within them to control the present. So let me explain this. How does this happen? It happens because the seer prophet son in this day creates the present through his ability to see the future. Uh, This might sound magical, but it really isn't. This is how Christ moved. What did he say? I only do those things I see the Father doing. As you see what the Father is doing, your intercession travail, your speaking of the word becomes the vehicle to bring it to pass in the present. By determining the present, you then control the future. You are co-creators with Christ and the Father. This can seem like we've stepped out on the limb here a bit and cut it off. But we're talking about the functioning of God's seers and sons. We're speaking of a control that's going to begin to happen now to be wielded over this age. 
This is something that we, we need to understand more clearly because the sons that God is raising up truly possess the ability to control the future by virtue of controlling the present. Go back over and meditate upon this. You, you, you don't have to get up every morning and see, okay, let me look at the news, what's happening out there. Because as you move in the seer anointing, as you see what the Father is doing and you speak it into being, that determines what the future is going to be. And the very next day you might get up or the next week or month and you'll see unfolding what you've already created because you have determined the future. And that's just the begin. That's just the tip of the iceberg of the creative word of the kingdom that's being given into the hands of the sons. How do you explain something new? God is doing something new in the earth, the earth of you and I. And we will constantly be pressed for words to describe this experience of sonship because it's not in the dictionary. We're in a shift, and the balance in the spirit realm is only now beginning to change, however slightly. This shift of balance in the spirit world will continue to unfold, as we've said before. There are aspects of God that have been deeply woven within the fabric of his creation, especially when you consider the scripture that in him all things are held together. We're only now beginning to understand that scripture just a little bit more. Colossians 1, For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones, dominions, rulers, or authorities. All things have been created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Men of science, in their pursuit to understand what is at the base of creation, have been able to identify just about everything, but they've not yet come to an understanding or an agreement of what as to what holds it all together. What is that spiritual glue? They can't seem to define it. But we know, for it's the Father, interwoven completely throughout of all, of, all of His creation, that holds everything in place and order. In this present incarnation, mankind has the innate ability to create what they believe in. This is something which sets us, sets us apart from other orders of creation. We have the ability, through what we voice and through our will and intent, to create. How? Because we are talking about the very inner penetration of all that God is, interwoven within the very fabric of our being at the most minute level. The strongly held belief system in New Age circles today is that everyone's on a process of evolution, growing, changing, and becoming, almost like a god. And we've seen the continued growth of this movement, whether it's been furthered by the Eastern yogis or the power of positive thinking. So many are convinced that they will be able to enter into their own state of perfection or completion by their own works. And they may have experienced this latent power or capability within them, but without Christ, it will profit them nothing, and they will not be able to pass through the open door, which is Christ alone. Christ quoted Psalms 82 as he countered the accusations of the Pharisees, but he was making a point. That point had to do with the inherent divinity of man. Psalms 82, Is it not written in your law? I said, Ye are God's. The word speaks that man was created in the image of God, Genesis 1.27. The similarity has not really been understood very well, but it deals with an aspect of the creative nature of God. When man was created, he was given authority to rule over creation. He was created in the likeness or image of God. A common concept concerning this train of thought is that we're created in the image of God because we have been created as a triune being, spirit, soul, and body, similar to the trinity or triune nature of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, I don't disagree that we bear the similarity, but I believe that being created in the image of God deals more with Psalms 82 than we've understood. 
what we are really talking about is the inherent ability within man to create. God has placed within each of the sons a capacity to create, and this is what sets us apart from most of God's creation. We create by our thoughts, by our intentions, and even more powerfully through what we speak. Whether you're creating faith, fear, illusion, what you lend your mind and heart to creates. One simple scripture captures the essence of this truth, Proverbs 23, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. You are creating literally every moment of the day. You may not have realized this, but nevertheless, whether you are creating faith, fear, or an adherence to the illusion, you're creating. In many ways, you're a microcosm of the Father, for He has placed Himself deeply within you. If you've studied the Eastern religions or even Orthodox Christianity, you would have noticed how significant mantras are. The practice of voicing and repetition, the mantra, has a prominent significance within these religions. Why? Because there's an awareness of the power that each individual has to create through harnessing their voice, their mind, and their intent over and over. It's powerful, and there's no doubt about that. Furthermore, what you focus on, you can create. Some would call that visualizing, which is another term used frequently in the New Age circles. Visualizing deals with the power of imagery, the power of the mind to create by seeing what you want. Whether it's what you focus on, how you think, or what you voice, you are creating constantly. I don't think a moment passes that we are not in some mode of the creative process. Whether it's your faith, your fears, whether you're responding to the illusion or the lie, you're constantly creating. Based upon what we've been talking about so far concerning the innate ability we had to create, I believe our concepts of a living word may have changed. We're not talking about the living word, the word of God, but we're talking about words that are living. It almost sounds sacrilegious to say that everyone is speaking a living word, but unfortunate, I think it's true, because every time you open your mouth, you're creating, and that word has life to it, which can be, as James says in The Power of the Tongue, either destructive or creative. The more you're connected to the source, which is Christ, the living word, the more powerful and more creative the word becomes through your mouth. The more you have surrendered your life to him and let that deep, probing work of the cross within you, the more the fullness of Christ flows through you and the more powerful and creative the word becomes that you speak. And they go hand in hand. Do you grasp the depth of what I'm saying here? You're in a constant mode of creating whether you're aware of what you're doing or not. Whether you're aware of your thought projections or your perceptions, all of it has the power to create. And this becomes even more critical for God's sons to understand because you have within you a power and authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. Once you really understand this, you can see how much more dynamic the creative process is through you. The enemy knows this, and that is why he is constantly hammering away at you to believe the lie, to respond to the illusion, to respond to the fears. He knows that you can create your faith or your fear. He knows that God has raised you up to be co-creators with him. It is of utmost importance that you understand the power that lies within your grasp, even in this temporary state of imperfection. Having a present incarnation in the physical enables us to enter the creative mode with every agency at our disposal, spirit, soul, and body. What is it that really sets us apart from our brethren, the cloud of witnesses? The ability to create on this level. The greatest advantage that we have living in the natural world, as we might call this, is our ability to create. This is what has set us uniquely apart from those who live in the spirit. You have the ability, even if you've not yet developed it, to utilize your spirit, soul, and body in the process of creating. Your voice, coupled with your will and intent, 
in synergy with your spirit, is quite powerful. We've spoken that one of the ministries of the sons is to see the release of the cloud of witnesses. Well, that release is tied into our release from futility, but as well it's tied into our capability to create. Having this present incarnation in the physical enables us to create and bring a bridging of the gap or an ending of the veil between this realm and the realm of the cloud of witnesses. With words that are creating life, what does the word say? Not one word that proceeds from the mouth of God will return without accomplishing the work for which it was sent. And who might that mouth of God be that has sent forth the word? You. The more you continue to rise higher and higher into his presence, the more the word you speak will be freighted with him, and the greater will be the flow of his word through you. You may recall the vision in Ezekiel concerning the waters flowing forth from the throne. It's Ezekiel 47. I'll just read you the very last verse 5. And again he measured a thousand and led me through the water, water reaching the knees. Again he measured a thousand and led me through the water, water reaching the loins. Again he measured a thousand, and it was a river that I could not ford, for the water had risen enough water to swim in a river that could not even be forded. These waters represent the progressive unfolding of the flow of his word through you. It has been a process, but we know the word is coming and is now here that will change the course of events on the face of the earth. That word is flowing from his throne, and it will soon be a river that cannot be forded. You are the word. You are the channel of that river into the earth, for you are creating the kingdom, and that is happening now as we speak. We know that the enemy is pouring forth lies and deceptions as it's referred to in the book of Revelation. At the time when the sons were caught up and the dragon went to try and devour the seed, and it says that it, you know, what poured forth from the mouth of the dragon. So what we've seen in this age is a pouring forth of lies and deceptions and darkness. And the only counterside to that flow that is still happening in the earth is the word flowing from your mouth that counters it, which will soon be a river that cannot be forded.